Okay. Yes. Almighty God and loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you who is the true light of everything. Father, we bring to you our worship. We bring to you our adoration and our praise. And we give you thanks that you have given to us the gift of knowing you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Father, we ask that as we discuss the thinking which is set before us, that we'll be led deeper into Christ and in our own lives show that fruit which gives you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Dear Bruce. I would just note that in the in the book that I took this from, on the Christian frame of mind, the chapter preceding this sermon is called The University Within a Christian Culture. I'm not sure who the editor was on this and if it was as intentional as it appears to have a discussion of the university right before a sermon that's given in a university, asking, in a sense, a question both about the university as a function of the academy and serving the church, and then having, in a sense, a sermon given in a church that in some ways is calling the academy to account in terms of how it thinks about the nature of scientific investigation and all that. Do any of you have have the uh, the Christian frame of mind? Yeah, I do. Here. There it is, there it is, okay. <laughs> so the, um, just to say a few words about that chapter, the uh, the nature of what he, what Torres calls the technological machine that has taken over the modern world. And in a sense to say that the nature of Newtonian science and then the nature of economics, the nature of politics has all become so technological that that which once undergirded culture, i.e. the church has been taken over um, the way you phrase it, only to find as so often happens that they're mounted on a technological machine that runs away with them. <laughs> the image of a, a kind of a, a Trojan horse, but this one here we're riding on the Trojan horse in a sense. So to say the university in some ways has been taken over by other interests, which to position Maxwell as somebody who in a sense took the call of the church to recognize the value of the natural sciences, to bring the church into alignment with the nature of the God who is revealed as light. Um, it's an interesting interplay of the academy, the, the sciences, the role of the church, the role of Christ, the role of Christ in all of that. He states that the, the nature of the university should be to engage in inquiry. Uh, and that inquiry is not just inquiry for the sake of inquiry, but under the truth itself. And he's, he's later going to discuss, in a sense, that's Maxwell's call, was really one who kept pressing at the nature of what is the truth, where the distinctions and definitions that were used in science, in a sense, didn't seem to be merely for the purpose of engaging the truth, but to serve some aspect of human culture. So the whole theological questioning that, that Torrance does so much of ordering how it is that we think. And so part of the nature of light also is going to call us into the question, where does one begin? And how does one take a sermon about something like light and make it something that is grounded in both the text of scripture as well as the text of the created world in a sense, which I wrote an article once for Crux, which is the journal of Regent College on the uh, the two the two books metaphor and just said it, there always is a caution. If you get the book of nature first and then read scripture, you're likely to read nature into scripture. But if you read scripture first, then it is enlightening as to the nature of what it is that is revealed about God in the Bible, which I think is the logic that Torrance is wanting to use in the nature of how he unpacks this sermon. He also says in this prior chapter that the whole work here is to be questioning our questions, that the task of theologians, and I'd say the task of the church at some level is even 
to question our questions. Are we even asking the right questions about reality, about truth, um, at some level, about the very nature of what light is about and how for Maxwell and maybe Einstein, these questions in pursuing truth led to a relational understanding that was more true to the nature of reality and to scripture than what one got in traditional scientific norms that had developed under Newton and so forth. Um, he also talks about stable open systems that going going from the parting out of the world that is part of the Newtonian, that the nature of light and other things that we're discussing in this sermon um, move us into a place of stable open systems that grow into that world. He does um, in this chapter also talk about Maxwell in preparation for what's going to be, I don't know if he's preparing or not, but um, not a little of this may be traced back to the replacement of the Newtonian notion of mechanistic models of connection by that of the continuous invisible, indivisible field introduced into our understanding of nature and of the structure of scientific knowledge by James Clerk Maxwell in the later half of the 19th century. It has also to do with the far-reaching implications of relativity theory, particularly evident in the foundations of knowledge with a remarkable recovery of ontology has been taking place as form and being, structure and substance are brought together again. Part of the nature, I think of this, uh, what I see as a preparatory for the sermon is the bringing together of things that were, that were separated, i.e. science and the church. And that in this sermon, there is a bringing together again with uh, Maxwell as a prime uh, prophet, shall we say, as one who sees the future, sees what is true, and speaks that in a way that becomes transformative of the people who hear. The last paragraph on the page before we begin into the sermon, um, he says, cultural unity is essentially spiritual which under suitable conditions can arise spontaneously out of human response to the unity of created reality and commitment to its transcendent ground in God, the creative source of all that is. Suitable conditions surely include an indefinite openness to the intelligibility and integrity of the universe and its ultimate ground, knowledge of which continually takes us by surprise. But they also include interdisciplinary study across the boundaries of all the sciences and humanities, which together with theological science comprise the whole field of human inquiry. So he's got them integrated together and a proper university in a sense would do that. And I think one would say a proper church would do that also. The integration of the nature of theology and science <clears throat> would be seen as a field of thought within the nature, the unified nature of reality. That is what a university must embrace if it is to be what it ought to be. And I would say in preparation for the sermon, that is what a church must embrace if it is to be what it ought to be. In other words, if what we say in the church doesn't make sense in the world in which we live, there's something tragically maybe gone awry. Hmm. Yes, Bill. Hmm. Was this given the sermon in an academic to an academic crowd? It says St. Mary, the Virgin, St. Oxford. Mary the Virgin, Oxford, England, February 8th, 1987. Bryden, tell us about Oxford and what, what kind of an audience would show up for St. Mary the Virgin in February? Uh, first of all, they'd be still wearing their coats and their scarves. Okay. <laughs> it would be perishingly cold and damp. Okay. Uh, so, so, you know, that's the first image I immediately have in February. Thames, Thames Valley. Uh, right. Secondly, pretty Anglo-Catholic, you know, high yeah. church crowd, which is yeah. fine. Um, they've uh, traditionally in Oxford, at least 1981, they hadn't gone too far off the rails. <coughs> um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I, I shouldn't be naughty. Uh, it's irresistible. It's, it's, okay. it's irresistible. But um, <laughs> I don't know if it was a context of even song because often they will have these sorts of presentations, shall I call them, okay. um, you know, sermons which are 
a genre of lecture to lecture, which is in the genre of sermon. I mean, they're pretty used to that stuff. Okay. Um, Austin Farrer, for example, would, would be a supreme example of an Oxford teacher, preacher, professor, who, who mixed the genre of sermon and, and lecture. Okay. I loved it. I mean, thank you so much for this. I, it was an absolute blast. And I, and I not, and I've sent you now via email. I've forwarded something to you. There's this re retired professor of mathematics, okay. who is a good friend of mine. And when I say professor, I mean English professor. I don't mean just a mere lecturer. Okay. Uh -huh. Sorry, he's a he's a retired chair of mathematics from University of Canterbury, and yeah. he loved it. And I think you'll enjoy the the thread that I've squirted in your direction today. Good. Well, you can bring in his comments as well in any yeah, way yeah, that yeah, yeah. the conversation. That, that's awesome. Thank you. No, no, pleasure. So, yeah, Oxford it's is a gem. foreign world for most of us. Bruce, what? It was a Sunday. It was a Sunday. February the 8th, 1987. Okay, it's the day oh, of 1987. Oh, My mistake, I thought, yeah. Well, uh, February in, in 87 would still be very cold. In fact, yeah, I wonder yeah. if that was I was, I was, I was really meaning in contrast to uh, midweek um, service. Yes, yeah, sure. It was, it was a Sunday service, yeah. Yeah. I have a no, feeling, in that case, it probably was even song. And I'm just trying to think, because he came to talk with us, because I was actually in Oxford in 87, February 87, okay. um, uh, for two years there. And he came to talk to the theology and science uh, group. Okay. And we met monthly. And that's the only time I've had the good pleasure of actually meeting Tom Torrance face to face. Yeah. And it, it was certainly, again, uh, very cold. So it could have easily been the same yeah. trip down south from Edinburgh. Very good. Well, a yeah, piece of history right here is part of the conversation. That's wonderful. Yes, no, no, thank, you. Note, thank you. Yes. The, um, the other sermon that I, that I posted from that's available on the Princeton website, that was 1980. So the themes that he's talking about here are deeply ingrained in TF's way of being. But to see that he was always a person of the church and the sciences were never far away and the yeah, integration yeah, of them, yeah. bringing the benefits in each of the other is certainly one of his... Uh, gifts to the church. So again, there's two biblical texts that he begins with here. In the in the sermon that he gave at Princeton, he only used the John 1, 1 to 4. What do you what do you think is added in this with the Hebrews text? In other words, there probably <laughs> there could have been enough with the John text. Why why did he include a second text, the Hebrews text? <laughs> Would that just be the liturgy? Dwayne, go for it. Brighton. Actually, I think that's it, the whole point that faith come by hearing and hear, you know, faith come by hearing and hearing the word of God. Because it, it's when we start talking about this type of reality, it's not you don't see with your eyes because even at the microscopic level, we're using these tools to go beyond our normal natural senses. Mm -hmm. So even there, there's there has to be a proper mediation of even that knowledge when we're using our tools and not get our eyelash in the way and think we discovered a new uh <laughs> bio or, or a new galaxy in the telescope and so because he, he, he had to reduce what he was saying and and that that's that's the hard because when if any all of us who know john mckenna this is where he'd leave us because what mm -hmm. He, what what Tom was pushing John to go after because he was taught by by uh, John Wheeler. The reason why John see most people know John, everyone thought he was just a uh, crazy hippie, but John and I got along because we were both crazy, <laughs> crazy punk rock, and he was a crazy hippie. But so we understood each other in our brokenness, and and he he was so admired when after he met Tom because he had the scientific mind. John was out there with the crazy French existentialists and despairing and stuff like, I think the ultimate thing is to kill yourself and all this other crazy nonsense. You know, and he he wouldn't mince words. He would just call bullshit, bullshit. And, that, and we were all shocked when we first saw him the way he talked. But he's getting at this aspect where, what an amazing thing, it, through the incarnation, God makes the knowledge of the creation accessible because that's our role as the priest of creation to to use word in order to, 
proclaim the glory of the Lord, how it all fits together and say, what a magnificent yeah. creation. Who's been the, the counselor of the Lord and who's known his mind. But yeah. this invisible realm where you're, you're, you're apprehending the word made flesh, the one who holds all things together by the word of his power. And John would spend time out there and, be, and he was, we took a class on space time resurrection, like about, I don't know how many, like it's like 12, 13 years ago when he's teaching that class. And the, he gave us John, Gene, John Wheeler's high point of physics. And he also wrote, asked us to read Kip Thorne. And he, he used to go and talk with Kip Thorne there at the uh, University of California Institute of Technology, whatever. Like John McKenna was a very interesting man. Like most people yeah. don't realize how brilliant he was. Yeah. So in the second one, the whole nature of things seen and things not seen, that's one of one of the things, which again, as we think about light and also the work of, of field theory, Maxwell's work, there are things like the electromagnetic field that we don't see those those fields. So the nature of faith here, again, I'm I'm tempted more and more in time to say when we see the word faith, there's a sense of science that is there in the best sense of the word science, meaning our thoughts about the nature of reality. So by just to replace it then, by by understanding the nature of reality, we understand the world is created by the word. Faith there is not my belief in something that is unreasonable. It is rather the shaping of my reason by the nature of the world that is there, even if it's invisible. Which I saw a cartoon yesterday with somebody sitting in front of a TV saying, you know, I don't believe in things that I can't see. And then there's all these words around him, um, tel tel television um, signals and cell phone signals, um, oxygen, light, love, emotions, you know, and just giving all of the unseen things that are so much part of the reality that we live in. Um, and it reminds me just a little bit of, of this beginning of the phase that if you become enamored with the seen world, that which you lose is so much of the reality that's there. That's part of our communication. It's part of the nature of our relationships with other people. Um, all of these dimensions would be lost if we only stick to the scene. And yet for many people, you know, I haven't seen God. Therefore, I can't believe in God. The logic of that is just, um, well, the word lenses that we're going to see, it's not it's not being able to take the lenses that Maxwell was able to take on and then Einstein to say we need to look from another point of view, another set of analogies to really see the nature of that which is reality. Well, what I what I love about Maxwell and, and my friend Doug Bridges, the mathematician professor, a differential equation, which is what Maxwell is using. I mean, I once heard it put like this, mathematics was waiting for a mathematician to arrive. <laughs> now, I love that. I absolutely love it. So say a little more but, about that for those of us who are not mathematicians. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. It's okay. And, and, I, and, I mean, I like it, but I want to understand it better. Yeah, surely, surely, yeah. And And, and there's a sense in which this man is total genius, Maxwell. Yep. But the genius is needed in order for him to penetrate into the realm of the unseen. Mm. And I think we, we just don't understand how weird mathematics is. I, I'll give you another example. Um, we all know that the square root of four is two. And the square root of nine is three. Yes. And, and when you multiply two negative numbers together, you get a positive number. Oh, no, says the mathematician. We will create a thing called J or I, the square root of minus one. Go figure. I mean, just wait a minute. What have you done? You've scrambled <laughs> your brain. So it gets invented in inverted commas. Many decades later, in the 20th century, engineers discover, yes, engineers discover that they can use the square root of minus one for fantastic and necessary equations to do with stress and things. And I'm going, holy camoly. <laughs> yes, mathematics is waiting for a mathematician to arrive. So that's, I mean, you know, 
the, 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 this thing is an internal coherence. Eventually, and I want to put this into the Hebrews text. The Hebrews text is eschatological. The whole point of Hebrews, as I understand it, it's not just a platonic up-down, visible, invisible thing. No. It's actually futuristic in the way this writer is using this idiom of, of, of Greek thought. And, and I love the fact that science is eschatological too. Mm -hmm. It progresses. It is increasingly unveiling itself. Oh, it's, I mean, sorry, I, I can keep going in this direction. Yeah. Sorry, puns so fully intended. Word, your use of the word eschatological is not merely the last things, but it is the state of things which we have not yet seen and yet yep. can be discovered as we go along. So to say the spirit yep. has an eschatological unveiling for us that yep. is part of the nature of what good science is as well, which yeah, corresponds absolutely. to the sense faith and the Holy Spirit discovering reality in your sense of the mathematician who shows up in at a particular time um, is all to live within this this whole sense of what it means for us as scientists and as theologians to discover um, that which is there but it requires particular eyes to see it so maxwell is obviously a yeah. prime example of that yeah yeah particular eyes that's it yeah oh yeah. yeah. uh, good Yes. Your question was, why include the Hebrew? Yes. And he, he quotes that on that text on page 140 under the uh, heading of uh, the, the one that was sent out. The um, Word document doesn't include yeah. web page or numbers, but it's under the topic, there are always two ways of looking at things. Yeah, it's on page one forty in the in the and down at the bottom we find that text bottom paragraph by faith we understand that the worlds have been framed by the word of God. That's the Hebrew text, right? Mm -hmm. That you ask about, yeah. and following that is my favorite sentence in the whole sermon where he begins a couple of sentences later or the second sentence later the eye of faith adapted to divine wisdom through the contemplation of god in jesus christ hmm. the eye of faith adapted to divine wisdom right you want to speak to that one <laughs> well the eye of faith i mean just to take Dwayne's point off, and the eye of faith has the ear of faith as well. The word became flesh and dwelt among us in the first of the verses. And in that speaking, there comes to be the revelation that gives us what eye has not seen. Um, and the word comes and dwells among us. And we, we comprehend a glory, which is not just seen, it's also heard that allows us to see something beyond what Moses saw. I mean, Moses was one of those early revelatory people. Um, Moses said, show me your glory. He was probably thinking sight. Um, Yahweh passes before him and says, the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding loving kindness and faithfulness, and goes on from there. So there's a hearing of that which was unseen, that the word glory, in a sense, is a revelation of that. And so when by faith we hear or see with the particular focusing in, I've got these binoculars here so I can see, there's a focusing in to see things that otherwise would not be able to be seen. Right. And so I think that um, the nature of what, what TF is talking about there, which again, the whole sense of what analogies do in Maxwell's work is part of that um, that work of coming to see things that we otherwise couldn't see if we don't have a particular point of view or perspective or the tools or what, you know, whatever language we want to use there. Um, it's interesting, the, the nature, and Bruce, I'm curious your thoughts on T.F. Torrance's sense of his allergy against natural theology, and yet he seems fairly comfortable with Maxwell using analogies from nature 
seeing in and through them, but doing kind of the analogies of nature first and then going to the theological ones as confirmation in a sense, in a way that's, it's not entirely Bardian for sure. It's more T.F. Torrance's way, but the sequencing of how one uses an analogy for both of Bard and Torrance seems to be a concern, but they're not concerned about, or T.F. is not concerned about Maxwell in this case, in this focusing in that Bill, I think, is pointing out and how, how it comes to shape our perspective. I mean, Maxwell wrote a lot about analogy mm -hmm. and it was necessary because when he was first trying to um, work out a new theory connecting electricity and magnetism, um, he used analogies of flow in fluids. Uh, and, and, he, and he carried over the same models or similar mo mo models from fluid mechanics into electromagnetic mechanics as, as he saw it then. And then, of course, he realized that some people were taking his models literally. Yeah. <laughs> and so he had to explain that he was using analogical thinking. Yeah. And, and so he, he, he gave what's, what's quite a complicated paper on what he understood by analogy. And, um, and 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 then he, he actually comes to the point where he has to try and distinguish between how something can be an analogy without there actually being an identity between the two things. And his solution was that in nature there are a limited finite number of ways in which object A can relate to object B, mm -hmm. and therefore all events or entities in nature have to correspond to these finite number of ways. And in that way, one is analogous to another there. Um, now, it, it is slightly different from Bart's hated analogia entis, you know, which mm -hmm. is a different dimension there. Um, I'm not sure that TF is always consistent you know, when he's talking about a hero, um, he, he gives his heroes great latitude, um, even if there's <laughs> problems in, in, in what, what they're saying. But yeah. I was interested in that last sentence of the paragraph we're looking at. Um, yes. Maxwell intuitively felt did not measure up to that wisdom, um, that he wasn't content. Um, I mean, Maxwell was a realist in the sense that he believed that ultimately science could give us knowledge of how things were in their reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, he knew that every theory we have has to be revisable, yeah. but yeah. he believed that we were actually approaching a proper description of things, even though it might be difficult to get to a final outcome in that. And it may be, uh, and this is just a thought that um, occurred to me just now, um, why was he a realist? Um, and trying to relate it to what TF says here about measuring up to that wisdom, you know, was Maxwell a realist because he believed that God wants us to know and understand his created order? Mm -hmm. Now, he, he doesn't say that explicitly, but is that what TF is hinting at in yeah. that particular sentence there? Yeah. Well, the, the word critical realist, TF says, we're not being critical of reality. We're being critical of our thoughts about reality in a way that I think yeah. corresponds with us here. So there has to be yeah. an assumption that reality is there and that we may or may not have it right. And so we put forward revisable statements and then we allow other people who have other lenses to help us see through their lenses, what is it we're missing? But assuming all the time that there is a reality there that we're trying to find language or metaphors, uh, analogies to understand what it is that's going on. In the case of things like gravity and light, there is something about that. I mean, gra gravity has got to be one of those things that you just kind of go, I know things drop, but why? I mean, it's a, you know, a child's question. The... Uh, it's not obviously clear. The pictures that I've seen explaining um, gravity use children bouncing on trampolines with an object in the middle and the nature of what it is that happens when, when the weight of a larger ball goes down then the children fall towards it. You can, in a sense, see what's going on. Um, I love that 
that image was used children in the process because it helps you identify with as a child the process of learning um the very nature of what uh john mcmurray calls the discernment of the other everything has to be emotionally learned oh that's hot Ooh, that's sharp Ooh, that tasted good gravity is something you experience but you have to keep getting a further understanding it tastes good because it has sugar or it has you know some ingredient added and so we keep discerning the other and so to say science is in a sense an ongoing investigation of the discernment of the other and maxwell had a persistence to him and that it may have been his faith that there is a god who has mysteries that were wonderful i mean there is something about what one might call wonder um that drives certain people on more than others. Some people are just content, you know, pass the salt. I don't care if it came from the Dead Sea or where it came from, just, you know. But other people say, I want to know why this tastes so good. Yeah. And I think that inclination is the kind of thing that maybe Maxwell has to understand things about the nature of reality. Bruce, you're ready to say something or I can tell. When he was a very young man, you know, just about 20 or so, he wrote a letter to one of his friends, Lewis Campbell. Uh, and, and there's a famous part in it where he, he says, I'll, I'll just read it to you. Um, My great plan is to let nothing be willfully left unexamined. Oh. Nothing is oh. to be holy ground consecrated to stationary faith, whether positive or negative. Hmm. And then further on, he then says, and, and this shows, I think, his confidence as a young Christian. Um, yeah. I am convinced that no one but a Christian can actually purge his land of these holy spots. In other words, oh. things that we don't want to examine. <clears throat> so he's saying that it's because I'm a Christian, I have the confidence to examine the world, to examine anything. Yeah. Because I have a fundamental belief that it will all cohere in God's word, in, 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 mm. in God's revelation. Right. Wonderful. So again, we're looking at the nature of a person, i.e. Maxwell, and the nature of the awakening of what one might call the scientific spirit, um, because one really believes that God has created this amazing world and there's so much to be discovered. Whereas many people think, I don't go to church anymore because I don't want to just be given a bunch of things I am told to believe. I want to be in environments where I can investigate and discover and explore. And so to say, you know, that is that is the prophetic call to the church today is to yeah. regain that there is no sacred ground that is not worth exploring. Um, can I be so bold, Bruce? Um, that lovely letter you quoted from, um, you better pass it through our dear MC here. <clears throat> um, but I we wonder if you could so send us... Yeah, he's that writing is... a book. I think it'll be included in the book. He's writing a book on Maxwell. Oh, naturally, of course. I love it. <laughs> no wonder he could turn up the reference just like that. <laughs> just like that. Yeah. No, it's a it's a gift that, that I've been waiting for and others for a long time because I think Maxwell is such a key figure. Well, uh, the short answer is the notion of a field is primary or primal even, for understanding the nature of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, as you know, Pannenberg uses it. I dare to borrow it. Um, I, it for me, it's indispensable. Yeah. And when you add the notion of a mediatorial field, uh, that is in fact what has occurred for us. Right. This enveloping mediatorial field, uh, which is the ascended Christ pouring out his spirit on the basis of stuff in space-time oh mm -hmm. man i mean let's let's go to the stratosphere shall we <laughs> <laughs> or the or the trino, trinotario sphere or something yes the, well, we're uh, there already mate we're there already yes um john mcmurray's final chapter in his gifford lectures is called the um i think it's the last chapter the field of the personal and in a sense yes. he is <clears throat> he's using some of the metaphor of field theory and just saying that we all live within this field. He wasn't fully Trinitarian, though he did believe that Jesus revealed um, the nature of the personal. So I think he's pointing in a direction also that you're talking about here in, in this text. 
So I'm going to go back to the beginning of the of the uh, of the sermon here in gospel and epistle. We hear of the creation of all things by the word of God, and I do think that the nature of creation, meaning giving God the um, making it the act, the intentional act of that being um, by the word of God, that is the personal one who we call Jesus, who is the ultimate source of their intelligibility and the life and light of all human existence. There's a lot packed into that sentence, um, but the whole TF's whole sense of uh, divine and contingent order, that there is an intelligibility in the universe that is dependent upon, contingent upon the divine creative act. And so he's opening up with this, this playing together of these theological statements and setting up for all of the science that will come in analogically to explain it. Thus we understand that all visible realities in the universe, which that's usually the, what we call the realm or the field of science, right? Visible realities in the universe framed by the word of God. So that is to say that is framed by a larger field. That is the word of God, Jesus, who is eternal, are to be traced back to their creative ground in the invisible reality of God. So in priority to say what we see visibly has in a sustaining kind of way, the invisible reality of God. Which Bart's going to say that even every breath that you take every day, every step that you take is all dependent upon, every visible thing is dependent upon the one who, who invisibly holds it together and gives you every breath that you take every day. So we have to be careful not to separate here the visible and the invisible in a sense. It was within the world of space and time. So that's the field of what, what Barr calls created time, that the word of God became incarnate in Jesus Christ. It is within this world that God continues to make himself known to us. So the field of this world, not just the invisible, is the field within which God acts in such a way that we can have this knowing of God. And again, it's not going to necessarily be through seeing, but as, as Duane has pointed out, hearing is going to be a, a dominant motif there. Hence, as the rational order of the universe is brought to light through scientific inquiry, and so just to say um, he's acknowledging the rational order of the universe, eschatological, as Bryden has said, that's the eschatological, it's all ordered, it's all there, but it has to be brought to light, that's the discovery process. Yeah. Through scientific inquiry, we may regard it as a medium to reflect and help us express the message of the word of God sent to us in Jesus Christ. So this sermon is wanting to express the message of the word of God sent in the person of Christ. And he's he's building that out of a biblical text that the biblical text invites us to explore. What is what is all this seen and unseen? Who is this person, Jesus? How does how does that have anything to say to, quote unquote, the modern person? Um, and he's going to say the, you know, some of the things we've been saying, the reality is all there. We don't see it. We don't hear it, but it's there. The nature of proper theology is that it will allow us to see and hear what was previously unknown. And this, in a sense, is the is the role of the church and maybe its greatest task. And this is the book I'm working on is to un unveil the science of the personal, that it's truly science and it's truly acknowledging the nature of the personhood of God and of humans, and that that is a truer reality. And it may be invisible in a sense, but it is the reality that is the field within which we live. We're going to look at Bruce's nice long comment here. I am convinced that no one but a Christian can actually purge his land. Oh, this is the quote out of out of the book. Excellent. Thank you for that. Marty, can I can I speak a, a little bit about what you're talking about, created, uncreated? Yes, I just want to make sure that we get the source of where that statement is coming from. It's a letter that was written to whom? It was a letter, is that right? Bruce, that Bruce, was a, from a letter. And who was the letter being written to? Um, Lewis Campbell, who is a school friend okay. of his, but, but they're both university now. Okay, very good. Okay, Dwayne, just want to make sure we got the reference there before I moved over to you. Go ahead. Oh, no, no problem. Yeah, see, uh, this book is actually really amazing. 
earlier on, he talks about this reality. The logos, the word of God, regulates the beauty and the intelligibility of the universe. Th th that's the word made flesh. And, then he, and and part of what you're saying, you know, you you actually uh, are, are channeling John McKenna. Because... <laughs> because because i'm actually understanding stuff i couldn't never i was i intuitively know what he's talking about but i don't understand it but i can yeah. finally understand what they're talking about because beautiful a, a part a, he in his theology uh essay fundamental issues between theology and science this is where he brings this out and that's what john mckenna was after his whole new book that's what he was trying to think through and he was breaking because it's in the logos, the, the one who regulates the beauty and intelligibility of the universe, you know, by, for, and through all things exist. He holds together the things by the word of his power. This is yep. where all meaning and, and this is the singularity. This is the unity. This is this is the, the one meaning and mode of the world, not dualistic. That th That's what John and, and Tom and these guys discover this. And this is what they're trying to break through because everything is made for him. And it was the gift of the father that you know from the father through the son yeah. like that's why we can't understand anything else and then when he talks about time because there there's four words that i've chased down and, and you can talk about bard you can talk about tom or you can talk about john and and john philopinus they're using these words created uncreated the the three ones that you can pick up he mentions these two uncreated or created life uncreated and created light and then the one behind it, you can't have life and light together without time. Those mm -hmm. things are. But the uncreated love that God is, is in the process of what he's doing here in the world. He's creating mm -hmm. beings of love and fellowship. That which takes time. And so when when Paul is talking about, you know, he, he created the light out of the darkness. He's talking about new creation because this new creation, yeah. mode, if he can create light just like that, it's not hard for God to create light. For, but for him to create loving beings, this is the wonder. And that's why he had to dwell among us. He tabered among He's in the three things that John picks up in his in John the Apostle. What is God? He's life, he's light, and he's love in his mm -hmm. three in his letters and in all his theology. And, and that this is all this is what the meaning of time is. And mm -hmm. you have two types of time. And John used to talk about this the time and, and and tom uses that analogy where time flows into the abyss of the meaningless and nothingness and you have time where it's irreversible and it seems like it was necessary but in in, in that same essay he says time redeem order and hope and close and open systems you know this bears another difficult question for which more attention should be given the implications of the direction of time for both disorder and order see this this is what i mean that when, when John, John's last work, I sent you his book, he talks about the Melchizedek interval because in him is all for the fullness of time. And he's, he's bringing the creation, both redeeming the old creation as the source of the new creation. And in his Melchizedek in interval where he's up in the heavenly realms of his ascension, we have to go up into the stratosphere, like Brian is saying, and to meet him in the air. Other human beings don't have that gift, and that's a prototype of the resurrection because we'll see him as he is. We'll know him as we'll see him exactly like he is, the way John says. But in this intermediate we time, him, we might meet him here. We might meet him here. We're we're, we're encountering him, and and yeah. and you yeah. hear his voice. He he doesn't say you'll see me. And what does he say to Thomas? Bless her, those who believe who haven't seen me. You know, so like I just like because because where I've been wrestling and sitting is like. You know, I know in my mind that Jesus is the way and where you understand who God is, but how do you approach him? And and when you're talking about the Hebraic, uh, John called it the little credo and in, 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 of the great I am, where, you know, the Lord, the Lord, gracious, kind, loving, forgiveness, you know, forgiving yeah. those to the thought. Like, you can't see that. You have to hear it. He tells yeah. you what he's going to do. And then after he does it, you can, how are you going to interpret it? So. Our, our theology is totally scientific inquiry, faith-seeking understanding. We have no other way to approach God. He yeah. allows us to apprehend and we'll never comprehend, but, and that's what the science is doing. And that's part of the physical aspect with, with uh, you have to believe by faith, a faith-seeking understanding that he created the visible out of the, out of the invisible. And I think faith, you know, once again, faith, we have faith that the sun will rise tomorrow because it's risen so many times. We're not as sure about our, our car all the time. 
because sometimes the battery goes dead. <laughs> whatever. And the nature of faith, the things that we have confidence in, in. Say, I have faith in the sun rising. I have faith that the rains will return, even though there are dry seasons. Faith, then, I think, is is best seen as a a way of knowing and understanding the faithfulness, the constancy of God in the world, even though there is this field dynamic that is present there that one lives within. Um, so faith is not void of scientific rigor. It is what scientific rigor gives us. So the um, this first opening thing to say, this is a sermon, and the nature of what TF seems to want to do is that ultimately we have a greater sense of the dependability of the one that created all things, holds things together, and that he's preaching this sermon today to further the sense that sight is not the primary focus, um, though he's going to point in the direction of light allowing us to see things that otherwise might not be seen. And can so I, can I come back and you please do, Mark please do. Um, I, I'm just interesting in your um, opening words there that we have faith that the sun rises because it's always risen in the past. And um, yeah, that was essentially David Hume's argument. How, how do we know the sun's going to rise? Well, it's always done it so far. Whereas um, the realist philosophers, the Scottish common sense philosophers might say that also. But TFT would want to say, no, we have faith the sun rises because we understand the physics of planets and stars. Hmm. In other words, we, we understand the logic of the structure of the universe. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we know it's going to rise tomorrow, not just because it's it's risen in the past. Right. Uh, um, so, 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 in in a sense, you know, just thought that that yeah, interesting yeah, yeah. little comment that you had there sort of illustrates the very thing that TF would want to focus on. You know, yeah. we're actually touching the ontology of things, yeah, and therefore we predict because we understand that, not just because there is a statistical probability based right. on past events, and so on. Sorry about that, Martin. No, 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 no. No, uh, the uh, the uh, work. The work of just clarifying language is what is one of the tasks, and so I think that many people would be able to hear hear the words that I said and say, you know, do you have do you have faith that the sun will rise tomorrow? And they're likely to say yes, and to say, um, is it because do you think your faith makes the sun rise tomorrow, or do you just have to imagine that it might, and you just live within the hope that your imagining might come true tomorrow? Is that what your faith is? Generally, they'll say, no, there's enough of the reality of it that my, my faith it'll rise is based in reality. Your definition is much more articulate, much more scientifically rigorous. But for people to begin to recognize faith not as the leap in the dark, is the, it's the point I'm trying to give them just a different lens to say, you use this word faith. And in one case, you go, oh, those people of faith. But you yourself have faith in every aspect of your life with things that you've come to have some level of confidence in. But it's not as far as what it is that you're inviting us to see that there is so much more to be seen about the nature of planets and this, the forces that work upon them and why our sun does what it does. And all of that is, it's truer, though not everyone will get to that knowledge. Does that make sense? I think, I think, I think the difference that Bruce has done as well is that he said, hey, there's a perspective, an analogous perspective that enables yeah. an expansion of the framework within which we're uh, getting our knowledge from. Right. <clears throat> and the previous person's knowledge is, well, yeah, it's come up in the past. In other words, it's earthbound. It's yeah. kind of ordinary human stuff. But what Bruce has quietly said, hey, once you wake up, in inverted commas, sorry for the pun, once you wake up to, 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 to a man called Newton and you wake up to solar systems and you wake up to the sheer consistency of it, your, your, your frame gets expanded. And I think that that is the trick that we have to give to all our students, mm. uh, that, that, that the framework gets expanded. And, and, and it's a bit like the kaleidoscope toy that you twiddle 
and the bits of glass get rearranged. The, the bits of glass stay the same. The sun keeps coming up, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But they get rearranged into a new pattern, and the pattern is an expansive pattern. Yeah. And I, I, I love that about expensive. TFT. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Bruce. I, yeah. I love that. Thank you so much. Well, I mean, it, it's all these examples where, you know, um, if if a scientist is lucky enough to stumble on <laughs> something in, in the essence of, of things, he or she can predict something which has not yet happened, mm. which has yeah. not yet been observed, and, and, and then become ridiculed for it. And then 50 years later, somebody does an experiment on some South Pacific island and says, oh, by the way, you were right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and they were right because they, they got through to something <clears throat> underneath yeah, yeah underneath yeah and my sense is in the field of the personal there's so much that we just we are unwilling to think that we can talk about the nature of how the field of the personal functions because we're afraid somebody's going to control us with that and so we are so blind to the nature of the forces that work on us in the field of the personal so we in a sense have made ourselves blind um, into the, all the ways that you've just talked about the sun, there are forces at work and fear is a powerful one of them. But I often say to people, you know, so what do you know about fear? Well, it's one of the emotions that we have. Well, how significant is it? Well, it's one among many. And so again, taking the biblical statement, perfect love casts out fear. There's something about that that, that says fear is a major thing okay. in the whole theological paradigm. Adam, why are you hiding? I was afraid. Um, so to to begin to recognize that in the field of the personal, fear plays a particular place that we we humans live with, that we are we're kind of aware that it's there, but we know so little about it that it tends to run people's lives. We don't have the clarity that you were able to express the nature of the rising of the sun. Can, can, can I come to you there on on sort of nature of the personal there? Um, yes. For, for, from just a particular perspective um yes and really arises because of a lecture i heard last year by um, a psychologist now i preface these remarks by saying that i have no problem at all with darwin evolution so on okay yep yep but the um psychologist um gave a very interesting lecture with talking about fear he was talking about emotional reaction to things yep and he explained them very clearly from totally within a Darwinian perspective. Yep. Now, I, I listen, I didn't say anything. I think as Christians, we would want to say, right, however much truth there is in that, we would want to say that deep in the nature of being a human being, uh, of being a human person, there is also something else which you can only have through scripture, through, through faith. Yeah. Um, now, in a sense, this, this relates to Maxwell as well, because yeah. the 1870s and so on, there was this big, big debate. Um, do human beings have free will? And the likes of Huxley, T.H. Huxley, um, John Tyndall and so on, they basically taught that because every natural phenomenon has to have a natural cause, then we are automata. Now, we are, we are so complex automata we think we make free decisions, but fundamentally we are automata. Yeah. Maxwell said no, and but all he could really say was that God has given us something else in addition to material forces. Yeah. He, he's given us something that we maybe call free will or soul, and it has a true independence of existence. Yeah. And in a but sense, it's two different true. perspectives. Yeah, they are two different perspectives. And one, one is a more rich perspective than the other. One of the assumptions of psychology is that the study of psychology studies the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of an individual. It misses the field of the personal. It focuses on something that's like the rising sun that misses all of the other things that you talked about because it hasn't seen all of the dynamics present when we recognize the whole field of the personal. Berg talks about this in 3.2 in his section on on body and soul and the nature of if you choose just body, i.e. Darwinian thought, or just soul, i.e. mystical or psychology uh, as something separated from the body, you end up in either case with something that isn't true to the nature of the fullness of the human being, body and soul, 
And he would then say, by the spirit, the spirit is the one who gives even our body and soul life. But the point, the point of the Darwinian saying something that is true for an individual. So you'd say, insofar as it goes for an individual, it's okay. It's just missing the whole field within which the human person functions, <laughs> which is a pretty big thing to miss. It's like missing everything that Maxwell and Einstein have had, had to say. I practice family systems therapy. Family systems always works within the field of the personal and asks how people are functioning in, in the dynamics of the forces that are there. Um, Murray Bowen, the father of modern family systems, said the glue of a family is anxiety, hmm. which is a form of fear, of course. All of the things that the mother and father do, the little, or why are you doing that? The tone of voice and all that, that's all the anxiety that brings people together within the rules, unspoken usually, and ways of behaving that shapes the family and holds it together. So to, to recognize just how families, how fear functions in the formation of the field of the family, not to mention walking out the door, first day of school, what's all the anxiety of peer pressure and all those things, which are also fear-based. Fields everywhere that we're just so blind to, but it's, it's the very point, I think, of what it is that TF is introducing us to here Earlier in the book, this is one of my favorite quotes on John McMurray, um, and I'm reading from the, the shorter version. I have um, the tension between the personal and impersonal thought. I have in mind here two of my see, my senior friends and mentors, John McMurray and Michael Polanyi, who are no longer with us, but whose books continue to bring provoke fresh thinking. We recall that in sharp contrast to the Christian outlook about life and reality, which was essentially personal, the pre-Christian outlook in classical times was highly rationalist and impersonal. And the suggestion is that this modern world that TF is addressing in the sermon um, is largely impersonal and needs to rediscover. Um, evident in its conception of man as cognitive being correlated to timeless form. At first sight, a different view might have been claimed for the Aristotelian stress and the teleology and that it appears to make room for purposeful behavior, appears to make room for purposeful behavior. That's modern psychology, and I won't go on from there. But just to say, TF really recognizes the field of the personal in distinction from the world of the merely biological or the merely cognitive, and not get all that is, is necessary to really understand the dynamics of what, in, in the field of the personal, Einstein and Maxwell before him are pointing to. And that in it all, Jesus is the one who really defines the field of the personal. And that's the, tri the Trinity, as I think you're pointing to, Bryden. The Trinity is the field of personal being within which we are created to live and respond and love and be those who love neighbor. And all that flows out of that, uh, that field. I, 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 I want to bring in something quite kind of interesting at this point. Yes. Human beings can thing. construct sieves and their moral sieves. I want to call them moral sieves because they are a way of which, a way in which we handle socialization. Yep. We can say yes or no to certain influences. And when we are educated, huh, sorry, enough to see these influences, <clears throat> we can begin to say, no, I will not let the base things, Psalm 101, be, yep. be, be set before my eyes. I will reject them. I will have a moral sieve that repudiates them. And I think that the biggest problem that we face is, is learning to cultivate the apparatus of a sieve. And, and I mean, sorry, I'm, I'm using a very crude analogy, if I can talk like this, because yes. it's, it's Romans 12, 1 and 2, in view of God's mercies. I mean, look at the word view. It, it's an NIV translation. Yeah. You present your bodies a living sacrifice, blah, 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 which is your reasonable worship, blah, blah, blah. And don't be conformed, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your noose. Yeah. And, and, and I think there's the idea of the sieve. And the whole business of cultivating the sieve is what Christian formation is trying to achieve. And it's a sieve that is a personal sieve. I mean, it, the oh, nature oh, of the is, yeah, yeah. And the, and the work of the spirit. So the question that you asked there, if there's a field of fear, what happens to John 
1 John 4, where love banishes fear, um, I often begin by saying, you know what perfect fear does? Tell me. It casts out love. And it also, also, oh, I like that. Mm. Also, the fear of the Lord brings wisdom, which is the Maxwellian thing. He it's intuitively kind of, discerned. Yeah. It's a different kind of yeah. fear, though. The fear of the Lord is a different kind oh, of Oh, totally, fear. totally. Yeah. But it's it, a field it, concept, it, right? If you live within the field of the the glory and wonder and awesomeness of who God is, your choices in life, the path that you walk will be different than if yep. you just fear your neighbor or fear man, yep. to use the Pauline yep. kind of phrase. Well, the so, fear yeah. is your, the first instinct of fear is you fall flat in your face, Revelation chapter one, or, 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 or Ezekiel. But then, uh -huh. no, 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 what does this God do? This God says, hey, stand up. I want to talk with you face to face. Face to face. Oh, what a liberation. Yes, I could write a book about that. Ah, come on. It's been written already. It's called Genesis to Revelation. Yes, that's my three-volume series. It's called Face to Face. Uh, I, yes, sorry. Terrible pun. <laughs> well, okay. oh, going in on that there, Marty. That, that, that's the whole point. What that, John, That's one of John's scripture quotes. What, what does that face to face bring? Liberty freedom absolutely because there's no such law against these things that are righteous it's only the you know that's what this fruit of the spirit produces a liberty that knows no bounds it's it's and, it, and, and it's in that freedom that we can approach the glory of god with with without fear and actually yeah. go in here and penetrate more deeper and deeper through the sun and this is what the father's always desired because everything he does he has to condescend and accommodate in, because he's unapproachable light and that's why this created, uncreated nature of love takes time. And it, yeah. it, has, to, it has to allow, and, it, and that's why evil exists. It, it's, it, evil <laughs> cannot sustain itself. It, because because, because it, what's the other, what's the corresponding uh, analogy to light? Darkness. And how men's yeah. heart loved darkness and how great was that darkness. They refused to come to the light. And that's yeah. where we're at. It's through the mediation of the sun where it, he does for us what we can't do for ourselves and is irreplaceable and, and it can't ever be duplicated. That's why yeah. it's a singularity. He comes yeah. from the light into the darkness. You know, like Baxter says, it's not sinner or God in the or sinners in the hands of an angry God. It's God in the hands of angry sinners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Great, <laughs> Once you get it theory. that way, it's like he loved us even so much while he was enemies. He allowed himself to be totally vulnerable and expose his love. He wasn't yeah. afraid of anything. He was filled with yeah. perfect love. Yeah, absolutely. So when we look at you know Maxwell on page one, it's a one forty eight in the book. I can't. I'm not sure which page it is in the essay. The paragraph begins by way of illustration, referring to Maxwell. Um, he he as a Christian, um, was living in in a sense in two worlds, but he wouldn't let them be separate. He chose to explore the the mystical in a sense, those things that were mystery. And so to say he's he's in the laboratory so to speak during the day and then he goes home and engages in family worship and reads the bible at night um all of that for him has lived in the immediate presence of god and so you know he as a person is integrating these worlds and he had to be willing to have courage to be that christian in the face of and i don't know what the culture was entirely bruce you would know how resistant they would be to the fact that he was a man of faith who took that quite seriously and um, as TF says, at least claimed to be making the insights from the metaphysics department, not from the physics department, um, for discovering the field ways of thinking over there. Would he have been looked down upon, Bruce, for his Christian faith being so integrated into his life? No. 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 No, I mean, the, the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, no, he, he'd have been respected for that. Yeah. Um, there was a movement in the scientific community which was questioning whether, for example, in scientific lectures you should ever mention God, um, and, and and that was which itself was a sort of um, symptom of of other things happening, especially after Origin of Species was was published in eighteen fifty nine. But no, from Axel himself, yeah. um, his overt Christian faith would not be a problem. Um, right with others no. right which is not necessarily the case today in the major universities of the yeah. world to bring yeah. in god oh. would be problematic yeah yeah 
Although so, I did I did notice Tom Torrance did allude to Lord Kelvin, which I found fascinating. Who <laughs> mm, mm, missed mm, the mm, point, yeah. right? I mean, well, I absolutely <laughs> poor old poor old T. S. Eliot one more time in the wasteland. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, okay, Calvin no, no. was a me mechanist, as it were. He, he he just couldn't get it, yeah, and yeah. and even after Maxwell died, he wrote something saying, "What on earth has Maxwell's electromagnetic theory ever done for anybody?" Basically, um, because he was still thinking in terms of push and pull mechanics. Yeah, and he 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 just couldn't make that jump. Although he was a great friend of Maxwell's. You know, he was the, 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 he was slightly older, but they the, the were they were great friends and did things together. Went to optical optical op opticians together and so on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, that that still... deals with the personal, though. That's the most amazing thing. See, friendship is the most important thing. That 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 mm. it's not it's not about what you know that saves you. It's the fact that it's it's a, it's taken as a gift and and seeing that's where the like that word humbly comes on later in that paragraph yeah. and sentence. And that's the way it is. Like we've been given means and way to access knowledge that people don't understand because apart, like getting, getting the hermeneutic right, starting with the mediation of Christ, we're far ahead in space, time and, and awareness than most of the church. Yeah. You know, and, and, that, and that's why God, that's why I said, why did God give this to us? Because it's awesome, but it's also a terrible burden. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and then you don't understand me. Like and that and that's and faith seeking understanding. It's and that's that's why our, our relationship with God is so important in the personal because he, he tells you and helps you stay together so that you can live your life and become who you're meant to be. Because all along the way, frustration or entropy <laughs> would cause us to destroy ourselves. <laughs> yeah, faith seeking understanding is in a sense a definition of science, right? <laughs> So the, um, the bottom there, there's a. It's I think it's maybe bolded a little bit. There are two ways of looking at things, which I mean, this is putting it out, just laying down the, the the options in a very bold kind of way, and it's basically break things apart or understand things in their wholeness. The uh, the book I'm writing on the on the science of the personal begins with a section called the splitting headache, and that is the nature of science that wants to break things apart into the theoretical and the quote-unquote practical or the material and the um, theoretical, all the ways that we break things apart, which leave us unfortunate visions of the nature of what is there, which again, that is part of the the problem of psychology. Though there are, there are some parts of psychology that are in a sense recognizing there are biological components to our feelings and emotions, but it's not all been made well in its wholeness. It's what Bar talks about is holding the, the two together in parallel with one another, but not fully integrated. So Maxwell was able to work from metaphors that held things together and didn't attempt to break them apart in the way that Newton, I mean, that is the classic picture of Newton in a closed field, whereas an open field, in a sense, understands the wholeness of what's going on in the the interrelation of all of those things. Now at the bottom there, that was the analogy that Clark Maxwell loved to use. Change the focus of your instrument, tune it to a different pitch of definition, and you see things differently. So this is that, the varieties of points of view. And again, this is where even the work of like Jeremy Bigby with the arts, doing theology through the arts, gives different points of view that allow you to see, or in Jeremy's case, to hear things differently. If you've ever heard Jeremy talk, he talks about a music, the, the value of silence in music is just as valuable as the sounds themselves. And so in For Elise, ya da 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 yeah, he says the silences there are just as powerful as the sound because of what they do in the whole field of what's going on. And so I think to really play out what it is that Maxwell's doing here and that Torrance is doing is he's inviting the people to a, a new place from which to listen, to see things differently, to hear things differently, and to say that the nature of 
the theories that we have are things that we bring truly as theories to listen in a new way. And sometimes we have to say, I have no idea here. I just need to come and listen again. That classic illustration of somebody, a uh, professor saying to a student, here's a, here's a fish, go and observe it and tell me everything that you see about it. Coming back later and saying, you've only gotten, you know, one, one percent out of the hundred percent of things to know about this. Come back, you know, when you can give me at least 10 percent. Just to say that our our ability to see what all goes into a fish, um, we are we are in a sense so limited in how we can look at it, and the nature of things. Again, I think of T. F. Torrance talking about the difference of studying. I think it, I can't remember. It was a tree, a cow, and he has a third thing. Maybe it's a person, but just saying we look at them all and they're all alive, but they are significantly different that to be able to discern what's there, one has to allow for the distinction within the category of living things. And to do the work of really exploring what it is that's, that's going on, these are lenses. Clark Maxwell, I'm reading another paragraph down, insisted there is a danger in partial explanations, but a danger we must recognize in the natural sciences. And I hear the word courage there. There's always a danger that we might not be complete. Um, we may not say something that's exactly true. If you had another lens, you might say, in the same way that Bruce corrected my perspective on the sun rising, um, there's, there might be more to, to say, but we have to, we have to say what can be said and invite other people to say more, which I call this proceeding with wonder. The, the task, you know, part of the nature of scientific faith or being the Society of Explorers, as Polanyi called it, requires that we, we face the danger of being wrong and give it a stab anyway. Does anybody want to think about the danger of being, I mean, I just think about yeah. the danger of saying you're a Christian today in, the, in a secular university. Well, M Marty, I, did, what you, I like what you're saying because again, this is I've been contemplating this for a long time. The order of being is determined by the order above it. That's 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 the intersection. We can't be go beyond the word made flesh. We can't project what God is in Himself as the Son of God or the Father, and and uh -huh. think about what because the, there's no correspondence. It's ineffable. There's no corresponding language for us to talk about that realm. Everything is an analogy, but. That place where we can rise to meet Christ in the air, where he is enthroned and actually realize and, you know, the eschatological reserve, because it it's not actually manifest itself in our space time, because this space time is going to oblivion and being judged and purified. But it's a spirit, our, our just spirit that's being purified greater than the sacrifice yeah. of Abel through this mediator. It The mind of God penetrates and co-inheres us and allows us to take that trip, yeah. you know, you know, and, and. Those and and Tom always used to talk about those appropriate attitudes. Like whether you're the mathematician, that mathematician had a fear of the Lord in such a way that his whole life was a, a conduit in order to receive what was flowing to and through and with him, and how he connected himself in the world around him. And yeah. and that, that's where holiness <laughs> comes in. That that some of these things are gift, but then once you get the gift, you have to change your lifestyle in order to go deeper and and wider yeah. and and but from the vertical downward this is the word made flesh this is the one who determines the meaning of everything he's the true man then that's yeah, why i see yeah. personalizing person humanizing humans that's the ultimate goal yeah right um your word projection is something i want to latch on to yes um and, and and i mean you know the story feuerbach and all of that you know that stuff but it's very profound if you start to understand the sociology of knowledge where societies whole groups for reasons of politics often and whatever else um uh, the language of fear the language of power the language of the will to power begins yes. to take over uh because the media today project very powerfully a certain form of reality yeah and i'm back to my civ business mm -hmm. and i think in the 21st century we have this very, very difficult um, tightrope 
of, of, of how to of how to take on board what is true, mm -hmm. but how to sieve out what is basically a projection from yeah. the culture in which we're now immersed, a culture which is again powerfully projected through the media. Yeah. And 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 I think that language of projection, we've got to, to learn more about it, to learn how to sieve through it. And I find that an one enormous challenge. Yeah. An enormous challenge. Absolutely. It's the corrective side. I mean, to say both Bart and Torrance are consistently showing people who've gone astray in their thinking mm. and why it is that case. Um always providing the alternative theologically of the nature of God giving God's self and what it is that we come to know in the light of that knowledge that is given to us. So it's, I mean, the, the opening line of the church dogmatics uh, for Bart, <laughs> church dogmatics is the ch church's scientific self-examination of its distinctive talk about God. The, the words matter and we may get them wrong in our understanding so we need to continually come back and make sure that when we say faith or science that we're meaning something that actually leads us to further understanding and doesn't just shut down the conversation sometimes i think and i haven't done this with a group yet but to say um i can talk about god but i don't want to talk about god at the beginning i want to talk about what is science and if somebody says I'm going to tell you some things, but there's a whole field here that I'm I'm just not going to talk about because it doesn't fit into my presentation. Are you okay with that? How do you feel about that? So, I mean, the nature the nature of acknowledging that science can say things about the physical world, but it's leaving out all of the dimensions, the human dimension, the personal dimension, Polanyi's personal knowledge. It's leaving out the whole sieve or interpretive lens through which the work is being done anyway. And so if we actually acknowledge that we're doing that and ask people, do you feel if I just tell you the things that fit my theory and I'm not going to deal with all the things that don't? How much integrity is, is there in that? And so to say, I'm going to begin with the nature of reality as established, built, created by the, the living God who comes and speaks and reveals and gives light using the the theology of this particular sermon gives light to the whole picture and not just the physical aspect of it and to say that's what a full science would do and i think that's what maxwell did that was so appreciated by tf torrance and i think polanyi and mcmurray it's the same thing they they weren't held back by the boundaries that some other people might have had and they were able to explore more, more fully, which the next section then where he talks about the importance of relations, that for me, that is the, it's the whole picture. The importance of relations is the whole of the universe, the whole of the human, the whole of what science might do without taking things out and only giving part of the story that happens to fit in your terms, the cultural agenda. Right. And, and, and unfortunately, that cultural agenda, you were talking earlier about the church and so on. The church has its own cultural agendas, plural. And yeah, then the different churches, churches have churches. their respective churches, uh, the, yeah. the subcultural stuff. And unfortunately, I think we're in a very fascinating phase of human development almost, because you're continuously like a snake eating your tail. You know, the, the, the feedback loops that we can get ourselves into if we're not too careful. It's a bit yeah. giddying, Marty. I, I hear you. My dog goes after her tail. So I, I've seen this in person with, with a dog. So <laughs> Can I just read out that wonderful quote of Lewis's? Please. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen back there again, not only because I see it, but because by it. I see everything else. Yes. I mean, this is what this sermon is doing as well, is it not? It is totally, yeah. And I, I quoted that in my face-to-face -face series because it's such a yeah, profound yeah. thing for exactly what I think this this section is doing. So Maxwell, in understanding the Trinity, came to understand di continuous dynamic fields. I mean, this is your point, Brighton. And the nature of seeing through the lens of 
what it is that is opened up by the God who's revealed the person of Christ, begin to open up what he calls, and I'm looking on my 151, I'm not sure what page it is in the other, Clerk Maxwell struggled for a long time to, this is the beginning of the paragraph, explain the electromagnetic field in traditional mechanical terms, but he was driven to the conclusion that a merely mechanical way of thinking of electricity and light was artificial and only partly true. So that's, you know, that's the selecting what, and what you leave out is too much. And so he tried another way without using Newtonian mechanics, which he called a dynamical theory of the electromagnetic field. And this time he relied on relational thinking, which again, I call myself a relational theologian, building on the Torrances have been significant and, and the value of that term as a task of what churches uh, might do and the very task of what Christianity is doing. As TF said, I'm a missionary and who I'm a missionary to is to theologians and pastors and people who don't understand relational thinking. They they still think of the cross and what the church should be in a sense in mechanical terms. If we do this, then we will get something from it, the cause and effect that is in a sense, a Newtonian world. So Torrance is opening up in this sermon, really you know, a way of thinking that he says, science has given us the ability to see something that was there all along in the Bible, in the living God. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> but we've been blind to it. And Maxwell has helped us to really get a lens here to see the nature of relationship. And it's not there necessarily just the relationship of persons. It's a broader relationship for Maxwell. It's it's all the dynamics of fields, even within what we call the physical world, but it certainly yeah. opens up lenses to see the personal world as well. So it's it's a, an important piece for that whole whole visual. Um, a page beyond that, right after he's insulted Lord Kelvin, um, he <laughs> talks about film. Suppose we take a film of some event and look at each separate frame one by one and then try to connect them together. So again, the nature of films is there are many small snapshots, so to speak, and the nature of science um, may often do that, take things apart so you see the small parts, but you miss the whole. So the nature of motion, um, the nature of motion or real time, as Bergson and this other person would call it, escapes us in that way. So relationality also includes the motion, the movement of things to understand the relation of all things that, that are being brought together. Calvin, he said, saw Clark Maxwell tumbling into mysticism. I was wondering if you want to comment on that, Bruce. That was, that's up a paragraph, the last sentence. Yeah, yeah. You know, just, just, just what I said before that um, Calvin, uh, William Thompson, um, he was really struggled with this. Yeah. Uh, in fact, one of, I think one of the first times that, um, Max also hinted that he was thinking of matter in a different way, was when William Thompson, i.e. Lord Kelvin, and Peter Tape, who was one of Maxwell's friends at school as well, they brought out a book on um, dynamics, and, and they asked Maxwell to have a look at it, and, and they gave a particular definition of matter, and, and Maxwell indicated he, he couldn't go along with that definition of matter anymore because he was having to incorporate his thinking about electromagnetic theory and so on. Huh. I mean, he, 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 as far as I'm aware, he never himself used the word continuum because he was really just instigating that way of thinking and, and other people supplied the vocabulary um, later on. Yeah. So that's the T.F. Torrance edition? The continuous, um, the continuous dynamic field is a edition by Torrance? to what it is that uh, Maxwell had said? Well, well, Maxwell didn't use the word continuum. Um, okay. Did he use the word continuous? I'd, ha I'd have yeah. to check that. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Bill, Bill asked certainly... here. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Bill's question, the audible light, for it is the God who said, let there be light out of the darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In in my volume two of uh, Karlbart's Church Dogmatics for Everyone, for the perfections of God, I I gave the image of a rainbow, but that each one of the we have to go from the visual of a rainbow to the sense of the sound. 
they would well, come don't in. Don't we have some heavier stock you can paste that on or something? Or of course you got to find some glue then. The nature of the visual of a rainbow and to say who God is speaks in a way that has the fullness of the, of the constancy, the love, the mercy, the righteousness that is, it's one, one thing with light mm -hmm. again, the rainbow is, um, it has the metaphor of light that brings out what was already there, but it's being brought to a way that it creates the beauty, which I love the fact that the word beauty appears in this chapter, um, as a way that sees how much there is there in God's being that we have to have certain situations to even see the fullness of that going on. And so, Bill, your comment that the, the audible light, um, if we allow light and sound to interplay, which I think is what we're doing here, um, we are enlightened when somebody says something. I mean, when somebody says something that gives us, oh, no, I get it. It is an audible light that opens us up to see what was previously in the in the darkness in a way that brightens C.S. Lewis quote, um, the words of understanding that which is shown in the face of Jesus Christ allows us to see who we are, the purpose of the world, the nature of our neighbor, not merely as somebody who just happens to physically be next door, but as somebody who loving them actually is something that Jesus does and we might as well. Um, all, all these things are filled out in the metaphor, but invite us to say it's even beyond all that. All five senses explode reality's perception, which is hey, to say no one of them alone can do it. And all yeah. of them just, they're just tickling at all that is there. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's the hem of the garment stuff, isn't it? It is. <clears throat> That's all it, it is. is. But offering the hem of the garment, and then, oh man, look out. Well, he, he quotes, uh, not John McKenna, but he quotes, uh, Torrance does, um, uh, pardon my stumbling over this, uh, Epiphan Epiphanius, yes? Epiphanius, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, he quotes, he says, we must open our ears to see. Yes. And Torrance yes. goes on and make and uh, calls that the audible light. I, I just that's fascinating. Audible. Yeah, because we faith comes by hearing, yes, and hearing by the capital W word of God. So we look into the face of Jesus. We are hearing the light that God. We are beginning to understand, aren't we? What the light that God has shown into our hearts in the very face of Jesus Christ and who he is in reality. Yeah. That that and just a, floats my boat. The context of a sermon. It's a sermon that people are supposed to walk out, out going, wow, yeah. there's, there's a lot that I've never seen before. But I get it now. If you don't begin with who Jesus is, you're yeah. likely to default to some mechanistic, narrow limited view of the world and there should be nothing more exciting than walking out of a church having yes. heard the nature of of the god who loves and creates and loves beauty and loves to see us be playful children and going that's, on an that, adventure to quote bilbo that, that's strengthening your congregation with joy is yes it? i mean joy the strength of the lord the strength of Again, God. Again, C.S. Lewis, joy is the serious business of heaven. That was Lewis's. Oh, it's a wonderful, wonderful business. You hate to hear a, joy I... a joyless preacher. Oh, yes. <laughs> Can I go back to dear Torrance? He go was very then. fond of, of Athanasius's distinction between metanoia and dianoia. Yes. And, oh. and, and, and for, for Athanasius and for Torrance, and therefore I think for today's discussion, dianoia perceives the underlying pattern or meaning or significance of that which in fact is precipitated through metanoia, but it's not brought into a sufficient coherence until you get that wonderful insight of Pomeuzion or whatever it happens to be that brings the whole ragmadouche together because otherwise they remain disparate parts until the dianoia triggers and, and, and you go, ah, oh, you know the ha ha moment, and 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 I love that. I mean, when I first began to see what the heck was going on, which 
takes a few decades. <clears throat> Some of us are slow learners. You're um, doing fine. The, you know, the dianoia of an Athanasius given to us via torrents, via the stuff of today, Bruce brought up this wonderful thing when he said, that which lies underneath, mm -hmm. it, it's a deeper penetration. And, and Torrance's gift, I think, is giving us again and again and again from multitudes of angles, this amazing gift of dianoia, wow. which is the a deeper, deeper. Metanoia, when we see into the inner structures, it changes yeah. our minds. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, I mean Lord, the image of falling in love. You know, it's only yeah, when you yeah. see this person and see that they're interested in you and you become interested that your mind has changed. I thought I wanted to what's stay a goer? single or whatever, but... Yeah, what's wow. a goer now, mate? It's a goer. Get on with it. <laughs> it's the wow factor. When you really discover the, the inner structure <laughs> of reality, it's, um, it, opens our, it opens us and transforms us, which well, is what a good I mean, sermon should do, right? Can we can we have a new sermon, please, on these three physicists who have just been awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics because they're exploding some of the Einsteinian assumptions? I mean, I, you know, it, 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 it's fresh news where 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 the, the the sort of subatomic subatomic particles can can talk to each other in inverted commas well, across mm -hmm. vast distances. Oh my goodness. Now, my <laughs> daughter knows about this stuff. She teaches it. But I'm going, oh, dear. The metanoia ain't deep enough, and the dianoia needs to get going again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And that is you the need... spirit of discovery. And, I mean, the question, need... just, the question Sorry, of the analogies, the you know, what does that analogy open up for us? Maxwell was fond of analogies in nature. So, I mean, the whole question, you know, what does what would a sermon with these three scientists look like taking – the challenge of what Maxwell presents to us, he's uh, towards going to go on and look at light, but you're you're looking at the subatomic world and the nature of the dialogue well, I'm, I'm, within. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, so, I I don't get it. I'm not smart enough in subatomic physics, for goodness sake. I mean, you know, I'll leave it to my daughter. <laughs> well, what, when you get the answer to that, I mean, your daughter might be a you know a new. Clerk Maxwell, who sees things that others don't, that open our eyes to see. Oh, so, she's a she's a secondary school teacher that freaks freaks out the staff, let alone the students. <laughs> okay, so Torrance does finally. He took a long time to get to light in the in the Princeton sermon. He jumps into light right away. He does mm -hmm. a lot more with light and all that earlier on. He's done a lot of work with Maxwell to really transform the, the hearer to recognize just how much there is that we miss. So when, when he finally gets, you know, it's just a final, um, basically two pages where he really brings up light as the constant factor of the universe, that which is, in theologically we'd say, is the constancy of the faithfulness of God, that l without light, there would be no life. Um, not in this sermon, but in another sermon, he talks about light and warmth, that the Holy Spirit is the light that comes that allows for the ground to give life in the spring as the warmth and all that comes. It's a it's a further reflection on the work of the Holy Spirit in the context of the discussion on light. But to say that there is here in this in this brief part of this of this sermon, light as that which is, in a sense, the fundamental factor in what allows life to be. Right. And it's an analogy, right? I mean, he's acknowledging yeah, yeah. what it is that Maxwell is inviting. Analogies are helpful. It doesn't say all, but to say um, we don't see light itself. We only see the light of light. We see that which is made visible by light. <clears throat> and that's where your C.S. Lewis quote is so good. It's moving so fast and constantly so fast that we can't see it. And yet there are ways in this whole image of holding up a piece of paper so that the light hits it, a spot of light appears. His question then, does that help us to understand what the Bible means when it tells us that God dwells in unapproachable light? Now, there's a sense in which the light approached us, right? <laughs> so we, we don't approach it in and of our own pursuit, 
but we acknowledge the light that is there in the same way that we don't pursue the sun because our wings will fall off as we get closer and the, the glue will melt and we will fall back to the earth. But to say the light has come, it was unapproachable, but it has approached us. There is the ordering of, you know, God before what it is that we do in our scientific investigation, which I call going the wrong way, sleight of hand movements, where we, we say to somebody, use this analogy, it'll get you to God, but our attempts often fall flat because we can't really deliver with our analogies. But when, when the light of Christ comes, there is something that is, as you've been saying, truer than that even which we can see. And he does um, switch over from the seeing to the audible. And again, John McMurray is one of the people who he does a lot of work with the Hebrew culture because of God speaking to Israel was a culture grounded in hearing, whereas the nature of Greek culture, firstly, but also Roman culture, it's this, the seeing where the, the foundational ways that they engage, what can be seen as real and, and developed from that. So that's why the appeal to the Hebrew culture for Torrance is so important, the audible the God who speaks is really the foundation of that, that as, as Duane keeps saying, that only what God says can really penetrate into our being as persons. The light may hit our skin, but the nature of the word spoken to us, uh, that is the where the metanoia happens as it goes dianoia into us, indwelling in Polanyi kind of language. As the word indwells us, it speaks. And if anyone is in Christ and if Christ is in you, you get a new creation, right? And so the, the scientific outcome there, add this ingredient, personal engagement with the living God, open up to that reality and you get something that is quite profound. In the last <laughs> sentence of the next to the last paragraph, the scientist has to discover the mathematical patterns carried by light, this kind of goes with what you're saying, Brighton, and decode them through coordinating number and word before I can apprehend the message they have to tell us. Bruce or Bryden, do you Gosh. want to speak to that? Gosh. No, I'm just having a fun time worshiping this. Perfect. <laughs> can I read a quote from I Paul? Mean, it's awesome. You can read a quote from Paul. Yeah, this goes back to what you were saying. See, I spent a lot of time in Ephesians 3 and, his, and Paul's prayer life because I didn't know how to pray. So I spent years praying these prayers. Yeah. And he says here, uh, to bring to light for all what the plan of the mystery that was hidden from ages past in God who created all things. So that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the principalities and authorities in heaven. This is according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. From whom we have boldness of speech and confidence and access him through faith in him. And yeah. that word multi manifold or multivariated, <clears throat> that's actually what you're talking about. It, it's mm. it's a one, it's a hypoxagometer, it's only used once in the scripture, and it's light hitting a prism, like you're saying with the rainbow. Yeah. Because what you have going on there, like that's the most amazing thing that you said that the light has come to us where we could not go to the light because it's it's unapproachable light, it's but yet scary. again. It's through the G it, and, and that's that's why that's why the word said to Moses, you can't see me. You can only see my glory because it's unapproachable. If you see me, you'll die. And so we hear these words. We hear this words, the faithful God, the covenant God of love, who's, you know, the Hesed love and, and Ameth, you know, I, I forgot those words for truth and faithfulness. In yeah, the Hebrew yeah. there, John McKenna used yeah. to, like, that's what his whole book is about, the great I am and his self-disclosure. There's no one like him. And yet yeah. he allows us to have access to him through love. And, yeah. you know, the, the analogy of, 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 and going back to what Bryden said, there's a quote there earlier on beyond in that section of uh, the word being the principle to or things, where when you do this stuff, you have unanticipated and an anticip unanticipated and under unpredictable disclosure. And we've mm -hmm. seen that all throughout our lives where we're pursuing the word of God and, and wanting to know more. Show me, Lord, show me, Lord. And then you have this unanticipated <laughs> and unpredictable disclosure. And it's yeah. like and it, and it helps your joy along the way where you learn more about who he is. You know, and yeah. we, you know, we share this with one another like. We've been given so much wisdom about who God is and what he's doing. And yet 
we're still pursuing this mystery of the plan that was hidden from the ages because that's what the angels and all these other supernatural beings are looking at there there's an order between us and christ which we've been ruled over that's totally obscured and eclipsed the glory of god and this is what the word is coming to speak to us face to face and it's like it's amazing the glory of god dwells in that man jesus yeah. christ well when the light when the light comes to us we also understand who we are in the light of the one who comes to us as well the the passage in exodus i think is echoed somewhat in colossians as God's holy and beloved people put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. It's it's the an echo of that. That's the light shining in a community who is becoming like Christ because the light that was there on the mountain with Moses has shown into a community who are living that enlightened life because of the person of Christ who is, is preached in, in the first part of Colossians there. So uh, if I could... Can I go back yes. to your question? Yes. Um, it, you know, that, 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 that extra, it is, that second final paragraph is just extraordinary. Um, these three guys, apparently, I mean, this is, this is a layman speaking, please. Yes. They are speaking about a connectedness, a necessary subatomic connectedness that seems to persist right across very large mm -hmm. distances. Right. Now, when we think of subatomic, we're thinking of very small. And they're quietly saying, no, stop thinking about the very small mm -hmm. because your sense of distance has now been shattered. Right. And, 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 and I think what is happening, and I mean, goodness knows where it's going to take us. Goodness knows, you know, the unexpected stuff of Dwayne's. Because suddenly there are subatomic realities that are shattering our sense of distance and therefore of space and therefore of connectedness across these things. And I'm going, oh my goodness. Beam me up, Scotty. You know, it's, 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 it's a sense in which our very mediocre space-time uh, puddle along down the road to get the groceries and back, yeah. uh, you know, it, 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 it doesn't deny that stuff. It can't, yeah. but it puts it into a, a, a whole new perspective that makes us go, oh, my goodness, what is this stuff? So much um, more. Oh, and, 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 and I think I'm going to have to sit with your jolly sermon now and sit with these three Nobel Prize winners. And if I, if I don't finish up in the loony bin, just, you know, it, it'll be good. <laughs> when you compare the loony bin I... to one person, maybe brilliancy and wisdom in the mouth of the prophet. I mean, people thought John the Baptist was a loony out in the wilderness preaching, prepare the way of the Lord. So yeah. Who is the who is the judge is a worthwhile question. Does somebody Sorry, want to say something? And um in in, in around about, I think it was 1876, um there was a bishop of the Church of England, Bishop Ellicott, wrote to Maxwell because he, he was going to give some lectures and write a book about Christian apologetics in relation to modern science in 1876. And, and, and just two things here. Firstly, um, he asked Maxwell about the beginning of Genesis, the creation of light, and the fact that light is created before the sun is created. Yeah. Uh, and Ellicott, <laughs> El, El, Ellicott wondered if, if, if that was a reference to the ether, of course. You see? Right, right, yeah. and and so in his in, in his in his reply, um, <clears throat> Maxwell said, "Well, you know, I don't really want to speculate on that." But then he added, "He says, remember that the science of 1876 may be different from the science of 1896, and therefore yeah. don't attach your theology to a particular yeah. science at a particular time." Yeah. Yeah, because he, he was so aware of the revisability, he, he, even though he was a realist and he, and he believed that science yeah. could give you ontological truth. Um, yes. he, he didn't want theologians building castles in the air on the nature of science at a particular time there. Right. I, Which is still I, I think what is fascinating, though, if I can jump into Genesis one, mm -hmm. if you see Genesis one in as a literalist fundamentalist thing, you've got a problem. But if you see it as a piece of literature that sees it in terms of, you know, without form and void, and as current literary analysis would 
lend us to believe, you yeah. have two pairs of three. Day one is paired with day four, day five with uh, day, day two and day three and day, day six. Form and uh, form being, you know, uh, the void being filled and the form being established. Yeah. And, and, and I would have quietly said to the bishop, please put on your literary spectacles first when you when you answer the question yeah and it becomes a non-question very quickly because if one and four are paired and form and function are going together as any good biologist will tell you you're kind of going it's a non-question and i think our problem has been often false questions are thrown at us mm -hmm. and we get upset by them when yeah. in fact they're no threat whatsoever yeah. none whatsoever so thank you very much, Bruce, again, for, 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 for saying, well, you don't even have to vote, invoke harmonies of the soul or of the mind or of the ether, because they, they ain't there, fella. <laughs> yeah, Brian, right. that's good stuff. That's God Cosmic Palace Temple. And then and then yes, when it you is. Wonder, yes, and it then is. when you want see this is the new this is what I was talking about. This is the new biblical theology, ancient or eastern stuff with John Walt and Greg Beale and, yeah, and yeah, Richard that's the one. They're, those guys are yep. thinking stuff together with the Dead Sea Scrolls that their interpretation is more holistic, and that's they're, they're, that we need to add that to our thought. I wish Tom was alive to to know about some of this stuff because he'd be able to think together some of the stuff, even the rediscovery of Melchizedek and the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were looking for Melchizedek and most of us don't know because we're Gentiles. That was part of the elementary doctrines in, in Hebrews 6 when he's explaining, you know, move on past these shadows to the reality of Melchizedek. And that's the work left for us to do. Tom, well, Tom Dwayne, he, others would take over. Dwayne, he is still alive, mate. Oh, sorry. Um, you know, don't you oh, believe yeah. in the community he's, not, of saints? he's just not visible with us. Yeah, he's one of the That's spirits right. made dress and dwells in, in the Zion city of all the myriads and myriads of angels are worshipping. I so mean, I stranger mean, just, things. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, oh just that uh, J.B. Phillips was having a problem translating the New Testament, as, as we know, you know, uh, his, his lovely little translation of the New Testament. Yeah. And, 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 and apparently Lewis pitches up, in inverted commas, when the guy's dead. And it helps him translate something. And I'm going, well, I'm sorry. Uh, what is this spooky stuff? But the translation gets done. And I'm kind of going, okay, there's something I don't know about the community of saints. What's next? <laughs> yes. yes, there's much to be discovered there. We won't go into all that. So oh, just dear. reading the last little bit of the next to last paragraph. Um, I've read about number and word before we can apprehend the message they have to tell us. And then the final paragraph. Is, is that not something like what we find in Jesus Christ? Again, he brings us back to Christ, the word made flesh, the real light of God who brings lights to all mankind. It is mm. through his word in faith, science, I would throw in there, which comes by hearing that we understand that the world was created by the word of God so that what is visible was made out of the invisible, meaning a deeper level. It is through the word of God in the gospel then, through the audible light of God that streams into our world in the person of Jesus of Christ, of Jesus of Christ, that we may penetrate into the relation between the visible and the invisible, between time and eternity, and enjoy the fellowship of the creature with his or her creator. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor. And glory forever and ever. Amen. So mm -hmm. the 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 joyful ending here, all of the things that Maxwell brings that you might think of in classrooms and all that, it really opens us up to receive, respond to, and be engaged in the joy of what it means to come to the one who has made it all and says, I've got a lot more than you can even begin to imagine. Hang in there and <laughs> let's go for a ride. <laughs> do we have any final comments on this sermon what it left you feeling when you were done i didn't hear much about your friend's letter bryden but no anyways, no no, no 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 it'll come it'll come just you know read it in your time they loved it absolutely loved it good and bruce no, no, no. Uh, sorry i sent something to marty this this professor 
of mathematics is a Scotsman born mm. in Edinburgh. So, you know, I'm afraid the Scots have a complete monopoly on this one today. <laughs> Excellent. Oh. Good. I don't know if it's a monopoly. I mean, it's a so this mm -hmm. the person who brings the bottle opener with a you know a, a wonderful bottle of wine. We don't call it a monopoly. We call it an invitation to participation. Oh, oh. So it's that's not what wine I, that's he brought. No, 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 no. He brought whiskey. <laughs> I have not acclimatized to whiskey yet. I've tasted it, yeah. but uh Bruce, what oh, did you want man, to you've there? got to wake up. I mean, T.F. you know preaches this sermon, and and you know he he always saw himself as an evangelist. Yeah. You know, so he would see this sermon as an evangelical sermon, and yeah. I suppose it illustrates that his, his his reliance on the fact that the best apologetics is good dogmatics. Yeah. You know, be, because he's speaking in faith terms. And yeah, in a is. sense, you can only accept the principles or even the outcomes of what he's saying if you're already a believer. Mm. But I think he also believes that it can bridge a gap to unbelievers because if you simply mm. express truth, you express the logic of truth within the work of the Holy Spirit, then that will bridge the gap, that otherwise unbridgeable gap yeah. to the mind and, and to the soul of the unbeliever. Yeah. Bridging the unbridgeable gap on our side, but not unbridgeable from the revelation of God in Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Again, this is in the this is in the book, The Christian Frame of Mind, Reason, Order, and Openness in Theology and Natural Science. And I just think it's a you know a fitting end that calls us to the person. It's appropriately located in a church preaching the calling the church to be a scientific community who comes back to the one from whom and through whom we do come to understand and that we do develop a christian frame of mind because that's the it's not a fixed frame it's a dynamic frame yes right it's an expanding frame and it brings beauty and joy with it as it expands and th thanks to people like maxwell and polanyi and einstein and others it keeps expanding and these three scientists who we have yet to hear all that's implied by what they're discovering, there is ever more. But it all comes from the one who makes it. And I see that hand, Bruce. And it just, it just came to my mind just now as you're speaking there, Martin, you know, the, the title with the Christian frame of mind. And I'm just thinking how blessed we are that God has given us a Christian frame of mind. Mm -hmm. You know, this coming Sunday, I'm preaching a very small church out in the country. It's Harvest Thanksgiving, so I'm going to be speaking a little about Psalm 8 and the knowledge of God and being in the image of God and uh -huh. the fact that we are precious in the sight of God. Hmm. And in our Christian frame of mind, we take these as granted. They are the background to how we think about ourselves. But for those right. who don't, are not believers, they, they don't have that background. Yeah. They, they, they don't understand themselves as persons, as humanity. Yeah. In that sense of being in God's image, uh, in being precious in his sight, or anything like that. And yeah. it, the two are, are worlds apart. Yeah. Yeah, and he is really contending for those people, even sitting yeah. in the pews, who haven't seen all that is there. Hmm. But that's the amazing thing about grace. You know, it is amazing. We're, we're, we're justified by faith in him. And, and, and even in that little amount of faith anybody has our knowledge doesn't save us <laughs> it just puts us under great condemnation because what are we doing with what we know <laughs> you know but, but it yeah. also it realigns our thinking to the one who actually can give us insight into what it means to be part of the created world and to know the creator so i mean there is a metanoia of who we are that we are being transformed in knowing the one and the implications for all that we are might be, and the hope for others as well, the nature of grace, as you say, when not just a word that we put on the wall, but actually a way that lives God's absolute love for us. Absolutely. Well, it's Bruce, interesting in so many um, science programs on the TV and so on, then the presenters often make the fact almost ad nauseum you know, that we're just a small speck of dust and a tiny planet and an insignificant solar system, blah, blah, blah. 
therefore we are unimportant. And a that lot. way of understanding humanity yeah. is becoming the background culture mm. of, of society, that ultimately we are unimportant. Whereas with our Christian frame of mind, we say, yeah, in terms of size, in terms of dimension, all these things are true. But that's not the whole story. Yeah, that's a great yeah, lead something the else, sermon. There's something far richer. Yeah. Well, Bruce, you're, you're preaching Psalm 8 there, and, and you can quote the Hebrews or Psalm 8. Yeah. You, you yeah. made him a little lower than the Elohim or the heavenly uh -huh. beings and crowned him with glory and honor. See, that, that's what's yeah. going on. That yeah. what God is doing in order to create creatures of love, which are different than those other creatures, because that's why they sinned or rebelled or whatever with their freedom. God in his two-stage plan of first death, second death, he has something in mind that even in the midst of a chaotic world, he holds it together by the word of his power. And everyone is actually entering into this just by believing, faith-seeking, understanding. Lord, help my belief, help me in my unbelief. It's just like, you know, that you qualify <laughs> because of what he's done for you and the joy that we're able to have. It just you, you just have to know that. If you know that, you have the access to all the joy in all the universe and nothing can ever take you away. So, you know, when you meet people with simple faith, as we would look at it, you know, that, that, that that's more solid than anything because they're attached to the anchor who's gone into the holy place that can never take their faith away because they know this one who secures their life. You know, and it, it's simple, but yet it's so profound. Yeah. Well, good. Well, next week you're going to have, uh, we're going to be doing another one of the articles from Participatio, which we've looked at Jordi Ziegler's um, before it was actually posted. Now Participatio, the anthropology edition is up at the TF Torrance website. I'll do be doing a link to it. And the article that we'll be looking at is, is on TF Torrance and personalism by who? Jordy Ziegler. <laughs> no, this one is by Marty Folsom. So Jordy oh. will be actually. Jordy oh, that's the other way around. We got it backwards. Me. He's asking you we, the questions. I forgot about he's that. He's going to interview me. That's right. So anyway, it's a it's an important question because um, even in the discussion we've had today on the nature of persons, Torrance had a, he had a resistance to personalism for a set of reasons which we will discover as we as we look at next week. Hmm. So anyway, great to be with you all today. I think that was an invigorating conversation with an invigorating piece to look at. I think, Howard, was that you who asked that sermon to be put out? Well, I don't know if I necessarily asked it. I, I had asked anybody if they had the article. Right. Um, well, that and, was probably uh, enough to Bill light a fire. He, so. Yeah, Bill said he had it. And then I said, maybe we could talk you into talking about it. And I think it just kind of blossomed from there. So we're just gonna we're gonna go ahead and thank you for bringing it up as something that was worth looking oh. at and say um, I enjoyed I, it I very take much. Those yes. invitations seriously. So keep keep those coming, and we'll uh, keep the weeks full for great conversations. Oh yeah, I got all kinds of nonsense questions I can ask. <laughs> you have questions. Bye, all. Good to meet you, Bruce. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bruce. See you again. God bless.